Hello, everyone, and welcome to Eastern Marshlands, an evening with comrades. Tonight with us, we have Goulash. Hi, Leds. We also have Comrade Pac-Man. Uh, that's positive. Pa that's positive, Pac-Man. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> positive, Pac-Man. <laughs> I am what happens when the when the whales nuke back. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have Jack the Lad with us. Pleasure to be here. I'll be your uh, host tonight. Uh, currently, we are live, but don't worry if you've missed it; it'll be uploaded later. Um, you can also check out our stuff on easternmarshlands.com. And if you want to uh, be updated for the next live stream or podcast, so on and so forth, possibly shit posts, you never know, uh, hit the like and subscribe button. So, lads, how are we all? What's, what's, what's the go? Well, I mean, day of wage slavery, like last time. <laughs> only, yeah. only this time. Only this time with 20% more pain and suffering. And, uh, 30% <laughs> yeah, degradation of my soul. Because of public transport. Because of public Ooh. fucking transport. Oh, brilliant. Oh, <laughs> absolutely love the... Oh, state public transport where I live is just... Mm. It's atrocious. But, we need um, Uncle Joe. Uh, how we need Uncle Joe to make the tram. <laughs> we need someone who can build the railways. Um, <laughs> where, where I live, it's... Yeah, it's pretty not great. But, um, yeah, I'm still looking for... Still looking for that work. Trying to get that dosh. But... Uh, the thing is, like where I live, the unemployment levels are really not great. Uh, I think the youth unemployment is nearly twenty percent. So oh, I don't Jesus. know if I mentioned that in a previous video, but it's not it's not excellent. There's certainly a lot of things that could be done to improve this, but uh, I don't have the answers. But um, I'm good at pointing things out. Well, there, there was an article I saw saying that um, entry level jobs are disappearing. Because um, employers want to pay like intern, uh, intern wage, but with the experience of like a manager, and the no, two things just don't compute. Yeah, that doesn't. Oh, sorry. I can't put those two together. That doesn't. Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, um, these entry level jobs as well. The thing to take into account is that they're not necessarily unskilled <laughs> jobs either. These can be jobs that are directed for people who are just coming out of universities and have graduated with qualifications as well. So the idea that we can't even provide a steady amount of work for a skilled workforce, let alone an unskilled one, is actually quite worrying. Well, I mean, we, we all want automation, but this is not what we had in fucking mind, let's be honest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah. No, um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you're you're um, about to, if, I, if I'm, without trying to accidentally dox you, Jack, you're about, oh, no, to, that's okay. enter, that's fine. You're about to enter the, the workforce, you're saying, because I bumped into you the other night. Um, <laughs> uncertain about how likely that is to take place, given that the youth unemployment level is probably not too much better than the figure that was read out earlier. In terms of um, industries themselves, they're, they're constantly being deflated in terms of uh, local industries in particular. I mean, the idea of full employment is something that is just... it. It's gone. It's not been in place since the 90s, and even then it never existed as a proper ideology. It's a leftover from social and economic policies from the 1980s pipe dream, really. In terms of being able to actually obtain a job within the current economic environment, it unfortunately comes down to more than anything than nepotism, so personal connections with individuals. And this is pretty hypocritical on the part of the actual people who introduced these policies, because they did so with the whole justification of it being in the philosophy of the entrepreneurial individual who goes out and does things via their own method. It's a merit. But reality, all it is, is just an example of inherited legacies going down through rich families. So, to use terminology the uh, figure quotes the right might use, it's no longer about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, but... Um... Well, it never was in the first place, really. It was just lies to begin with. I mean, if you look at the policies that they put in place to try and match their rhetoric, there's no sort of 
cohesive. Well, there's nothing but contradictory messages anyway. I mean, we have these types of people who are trying to push notions of meritocratic societies and at the same time they're more than willing to lower things like inheritance taxes or merge them further into capital gains as well. Um, if you really do actually want to create a sort of social environment, if you want to go along that sort of free market sort of thing, you actually need to take into account all sorts of different advantages somebody will actually have first coming into the world. So I'm talking at birth here in terms of family connections, race, ethnicity, gender is the other major thing and actually create policies that interact with these head on, not in some sort of, well, they kind of go in passive ways depending on what sort of line you want to go down. I've been talking for a while. Does anybody want to jump in? Well, I, I basically was simply going to do my standard repertoire of snide remarks, but no, really, in all, in all sense, um, my position was simply a response to that one when the right wing says, you know, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. It kind of works under the pretense that you actually have boots to put straps in. Um, yeah. Like, we don't have boots. We, 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 we had the boots stolen from us by the rich, so I'm not sure. And then we have to beg for our boots back. So um, I'm not, I know that's torturing a metaphor beyond its capacity, but essentially we're, we're going cap in hand to the bourgeoisie begging for our jobs back, and they're just not there. Um, <laughs> and, and even when you manage to get a job from them, they'll pay you as little amount as possible until you have to get two jobs just to survive, and then you can't work both, and you get stressed, and then you have to leave both, and then the process repeats itself over again. I was just going to add that, um, going back to what um, Pac-Man said about, like, when I apply for all these jobs and whatnot, it's usually around the same sort of general area. But there's only so many times you can apply for a, a McDonald's or a Target or whatever. And so when they say, like, you know, oh, I, I see you haven't applied for too many jobs recently, like, there are no jobs to apply for. Like, there are, like, all of these places, they're just flat out not hiring. Except um, uh, the, there are uh, positions open or advertised for especially on seek.com, for CEOs of businesses. And I applied to one yes. the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I got shortlisted. CEOs of businesses. One of my yeah. friends did, um, uh, they did start a, a business, but um, it didn't get very far. It was only there, it was only for a few months. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, look, seeking CEOs of businesses, that's just ridiculous. Like who, like what 20 year old, is a CEO exactly, and and uh, there's 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 people constantly saying um, uh, when I say people I mean there's people uh, possibly you know from the Liberal Party I'm sorry I cannot remember who said it but they said um, if young people are out of out of work and they need a job then they should start their own business. And oh, I think that was. Oh, I. I that yeah, sounds I, I like America this was, line. This yeah. was. I think that, that was during the um, the Abbott uh, government. But I certainly remember someone saying that. Oh yes, yes, the the, the great and noble Ab Abbott government who decided <laughs> that social policy for women in this country should be to relegate them to household duties again. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks for that. <laughs> I honestly can't believe that man used to run this country. And, uh, oh, it is ridiculous. <laughs> no, but it was just that, like, you know, he got into hot water, for, to put a bit of context on that. He got into a bit of hot water where he said in the Houses of Parliament, you know, that women should be at home doing the ironing. Yeah. You know, and you could you could just feel the, um, the uh, Tory conservatism drip off him, <laughs> like, you know, as he said yeah. that. Well, to push What's, it even further, when he was trying to justify that, they were saying, who does the cleaning in the Abbott household? And he said, the maid does the cleaning in the Abbott yeah. household. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah, digging up the that hole. Again, it's but, sort of a more of a yeah, class when, thing then, isn't it? Unionize. Well, it's everything. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've got... Um, Man represents everything that's wrong in terms of how the capitalist <laughs> narrative is meant to be taken. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Like you've got um, these rich people with maids and butlers and, and, and whatnot in 
all making up like the Liberal Party, the National Party, and then they're in government, and then suddenly they say, "Oh yeah, the the poor can just dip into their savings if if they're running out of uh, spare cash to throw around." And I'm like, I, I, I was I when I saw that, I was screaming at my screen saying, "There is none." <laughs> Magical yeah, there's... savings coming from. It reminds me of um, on a bit of a different level when I think it was Theresa May said that there, you know, there is no magical money tree. But then they always, <laughs> but when it comes to like, oh, more spending for, oh, just the most useless shit. Just uh, I want to say like vanity projects and whatnot. But like, it's there's always a magic money tree for that. Well, yeah. Um, in terms of getting the support, we all know that Theresa May had to form minority government after the last election in the UK and uh, the criticism that was initially put forth by um, not only uh, just people from the Labour Party but even some former Tory policy um, advisors was that all of a sudden is that they were putting aside large sums of money for infrastructure projects in Northern Ireland. <laughs> I mean, they couldn't have even tried to hide the policy tactic a little bit. It was all released together at once at one package. Did they, even, did, did they even, like, uh, cost their manifesto f during that election, though? Well, if I they think... did, they certainly didn't broadcast what the costing figures were. My only reasoning behind that is because they were afraid that the public would find out that they were useless at economics. <laughs> that, that and, it would, and they would be able to track to every single palm they greased in Parliament on the way there. The one thing I really liked about Jeremy Corbyn's manifesto was the, and it was a manifesto, let's not get that wrong, purely because you can tell that the Labour policy staffers and Jezza himself sort of looked at it and he went, you know what, fuck it. Like, you know what, fuck it. Let's see what we can put on paper and let's see what we can get away with. Because they, they didn't have any illusions of winning, so they ran on as close to a Demsoc platform as you could get in, in Western politics. And he almost fucking won. Now, that gives me a little bit of hope that people are just so pissed off with capitalism and neoconservatism in general that they just want change. They want to take it to them. And, uh, well, yeah, in the, uh, in, the, in the Labour Party of Britain, there was a leadership spill. And as a joke, a few MPs nominated Jeremy Corbyn and he won by, <laughs> by a big margin. And then, of course, there was um, another leadership spill and then Jeremy Corbyn won even more that time. <laughs> so not only in the the Labour Party of of, of England was there, is there this growing support for people like Jeremy Corbyn, and uh, hopefully you know it's more support for Dem Sock in in the party. It's growing in in England. But uh, I guess I guess my question to you guys is: Could a movement like that? happen in Australia? Could there be this big socialist reform within the Labour Party? Could we achieve fully automated, luxury gay space communism within the next 10 years? Mm. <laughs> I love uh, just the noises, the concern. Uh, the uh, noises. Uh, like, you know, like, I want to believe. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want but to believe, like, yeah. No, no. <laughs> announcing the brand new radical socialist candidate for South Australia, Bill Shorten. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> no you know what? You, or, or the political corpse of Mike Rand just sort of comes out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> political like, corpse. <laughs> oh, I know, he's not actually dead, yeah. but it's kind of like a metaphor, I guess. Just, you know. I, I don't honestly see it happening here, no, but I um we can I'd, I'd certainly like to <laughs> I'd certainly like to believe that um I okay. Hot take here. Hot take coming up, boys. Are you ready? Oh boy, what we up. need to, I honestly believe that we need to sort of Okay, I don't want to throw the word cult of personality <laughs> around, but golf Whitlam, alright? Okay. <laughs> Yes, yes. But back Goff. then we need to like. I don't even think we need to like rehabilitate his image. I think it's perfect as it is. I think we need to like remind the country of the reforms that happened uh, under the Whitlam government, and I want to believe that that should be enough. They're obviously That's, convincing. Obviously, no, that is there very, is that is very true. Um, 
I'll comment on this by saying that I actually am a member of the ALP personally myself. And one of the ways you can distinguish people's political alignment is actually talking about which Labour Party legacies they would admire the most. Now, if you were talking about somebody who's part of one of the centrist gangs, they'll constantly make references to Bob Hawke or Paul Keating. Whereas if you are talking to somebody who's part of the democratic socialist left, then they will consistently talk about the policies that were instituted underneath Gough Whitlam or even other earlier figures like John Curtin or Ben Chifley. Ben Chifley, a man who nearly nationalised Australia's banking system. <laughs> Bless. A legacy that... John Cur- okay, the thing is, to. John Curtin, John Curtin, economically woke, socially broke. True. <laughs> understandable. Yeah, it, it oh, is no, understandable. I, I mean, the yeah, problem I, is when you're going back and looking at past examples is that they're as much um, reflective of their social environments as, as much as they are in reaction to trying to institute some sort of legacy of political difference and acti- activism, trying to advance that whole idea of... Um, the socially conscious cause forth. So it's they're never black and white in their legacies. Even people like uh, Ben Shifley had uh, different associations with the white Australia policy. Oh yeah, I mean, of course. I think uh-huh. not to not to discourage and say like, oh, it was a different time then, and then just sort of yeah. accept that oh that that was okay because it was it was during that time. I think we should. Acknowledge that the white Australia policy was bad and very absolutely not good, but we should also look at again, like you said, with uh, Chifley and the the complete nationalisation. I think there are a lot of good things uh, that we can take note of. Is there going to well, be trouble uh, trying to bring this new this this image of say Goff or uh, the other people you mentioned? Trying to take that image and selling it to the Australian people, in that um, in that you say, oh, we've got this, you know, this this uh, the Gough Whitlam idea of of democratic socialism, and then they say, oh, like how they spent too much money, or or you say, oh, we've got this policy back from the forties, like what the white Australia policy? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there is a lot yeah. of oh yeah, there is going to be a lot of stigma attached to that, as as, as should there be. Um. Oh, sorry. First, uh, <coughs> Christ. Um, first, uh, to uh, in response to Jack in regards to the sort of the the factions within the uh, Labor Party, I think that like I live in an area where the sort of socialist wing is very, very active. So that's that's a thumbs up right there. Um, in regards to, I, I, I want to say, I, I do believe that we should rehabilitate these images of. Um, I think very progressive for the 40s and for the 50s and what have you. I think that it's important to take note of the the economic standpoint that they used. The um, like even Whitlam, like some of the things that he did for for like the 70s, because we've just come out of this, you know, the eternal Menzies. We've come out of that era where he was just he kept the country as like as literally like a, a his big out out outdoors farmyard where there's cows Big grazing on the fields. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the cork hats and the the toilets outside that are made of, like, metal and whatnot. So it's his the, fault the that Americans think we all wear cork hats. <laughs> yeah, it's him and no one else. <laughs> but I think it's important that we recognise that even though there were controversial views held in that time, not, uh, not, not Gough Whitlam, he held nothing that was unsavory blessed be his holy name uh peace be upon him but i think we should again it's it's about those those figures of the 40s uh curtain uh first dibs punch and libs but i don't know where i'm going with this but i i think it is important to uh to sort of yeah to reaffirm uh our sort of not imagining not imagining but sort of understanding of these these figures and so and replicate so understanding the roots of the the Labour Party in in these individuals who tried to keep the party democratic socialist, and then try to, <coughs> for the future, present that to 
the people of Australia and say, look how could ha, look how good we were, and this is how good we can be in the future. I think that's a fair call. That's that's what I'm. That's yeah. That's a better way of putting it than I did, but thumbs up for that. Well, the idea behind the socialist democratic socialist cause is not so much that you're bringing everybody to a point of equality it's that you're actually advancing along this time period and aka we're not trying to rebuild to some previous point that's more a characteristic of the right more than anything and donald trump's a perfect example of it make america great again of course no one exactly knows what period he's talking about whether or not it's confederate states or who knows um ulysses s grant no it's um, some imagined past state. We're trying to build towards some sort of brighter imagined future, which hasn't actually yet occurred. And it is sort of difficult because in the democratic system, you obviously do need the consent of the people. It's um, the entire social and political system is based on that. <laughs> but in terms of how you sort of capture that support amongst the populace, there's this, another saying that comes out of the United States when they're comparing the types of people who vote Republican to the people who vote Democrat. They say Republicans want to fall in line, whereas Democrats want to fall in love. In terms of whether or not that resonates into Australia, that's a different question altogether, but I think it highlights the point in that you actually have to sort of capture that romantic part of the imagery that's backed by sound and stable policies that benefit people. Well, I don't think it's a completely alien concept to the Australian electorate. I think it's more, I think it's more just the attitude and the kind of history that Australia has in dealing with politics. I see a lot of parallels with US politics in terms of the type of people who vote a certain way. Um, I think that when I look at people who vote Labor in Australia, it's like youth is one big part of it. The youth vote Labor almost exclusively. As far as I can see, at least in most cases, unless you run into the young liberals and uh, hope that you don't. Um, Soon to become the liberals. Uh, the young liberals. Yay. What a bunch. Um, hey, what a character. Oh, what a, what a bunch of lads. Because um, <laughs> uh, literally, they are all men. Um, <laughs> if only that was a joke. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> You're not even a joker. That's the truth. <laughs> Virgin Young Liberal against Chad Labor Party Junior Member. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Go get him, Jack, you tiger. Get out there. Um, no, but seriously, it's it's kind of like, oh, I was going somewhere pro profound with this. Um, no, okay, well, now I know what I'm talking about, uh, I, I think. Um, mainly it's just the kind of characters you see, because I noticed that, Reactionism in Australia seems to be the biggest draw for the Liberal Party. I mean, the thing that won the Liberal Party the last election was simply just a blatant, like, non-stop attack on immigration. They just pulled the, they pulled the full xenophobia card. They just went, yeah. xenophobia, Australians hate foreigners. There so we they, go. So they went on a platform of trying to keep the scared safe just to get their vote? Yeah, but you see, the thing is, I think it... Not to go on my, um, you know, ultra tanky, um, gulag the kulaks kind of spiel, but it, it's the same thing. It's it's the same thing that you always see. It's identity politics on the right side of things, in the sense that, you know, instead of focusing on the class issues, which I work, as I said, as you guys all, well, Jack doesn't, but you guys know who I work for in real life. So you guys both know that I uh, work for a company, which means I talk to literally every sort of bracket of people in Australia. And it doesn't matter whether they're someone with a bunch of services with my company who are rich, obviously middle class or wealthy, or another group of people who are like very poor and only have a couple of cheap services with my company. Um, uh, they almost all like if you talk about the world events and like you know current affairs in Australia and stuff like that, um, doesn't matter. Even 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 petite Borgi holds stuff like Medicare and you know. So the reforms all... that Gough Whitlam made, all of them hold them in high regard and universally sort of come across the same sort of policy. So the conclusion I've sort of drawn from that is the Australian electorate is more affected by social policy, like we've seen with gay marriage recently, and by, um, you know, 
identity politics in a lot of ways than they are as it were as in the identity of what it means to be an Australian rather than you know practical policy um, like you know again in my business we deal with the MBN a lot and quite frankly whenever I mention how the Liberal government handled it I subtly throw that in there like <laughs> the Labour government had the Labour government had a plan for two types of MBN you had wireless for regional areas and you had fiber to the premises for suburban areas right of course that's expensive because you have to install fiber to every house um, the, lib the Liberal government came along and said right what we're going to do is we're going to customize each type of NBN to suit the regional needs so this way what we'll do is we'll save on money by um, installing fiber down the street and keeping the old copper infrastructure in people's homes so we don't have to worry about renovation and all that sort of thing. The only problem is when they did that, it didn't account for regional areas. It didn't account for you know different types. So now, when we started off with two types of MBN, now at, at my workplace, we have to somehow organize seven different types of MBN and production runoff and you know contract time and all that sort of thing. You roll it in together under the liberal under the liberal government the NBN is now 10 times more expensive than what it was originally going to be. And then you sort of look back on it and the whole platform that the Liberal Party ran on for taking over the NBN was that, oh, we're going to cut costs and make it more affordable. That was and their entire platform. And they haven't. Exactly. Which, oh, and course. that resonates, especially with, you know, the younger generation and even with the middle class, like the, uh, the, upper, the upper middle class who have, all the, who have all the toys, like all the technology, and now trying to run their businesses and run, you know, their personal services on NBN. And, you know, they are disenfranchised with the entire Australian political system. And I'm seeing a lot of sympathy. I, I was talking to a guy who ran his own business just today, actually, you know, Petit Borgie as you would call him. And, um, you know, I, I, I simply said to him, look, mate, you know what I reckon? In, in my perfect world, I put on an extra Bogan accent when I'm on the phones, just so, you know, trust me, it, it works. Um, <laughs> I'm like, look, mate, if you want to, you know, I reckon we should be in a world where instead of policy for, instead of policy for electrical engineering being done by politicians, perhaps the electrical engineers should make the policy. <laughs> like yeah, we even, should, you know, um, see the production or something. Um, even, uh, even Kevin Rudd was uh, on the news either tonight <laughs> or recently talking uh, about... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking specifically about how... Um, like just, just ripping into Malcolm saying, like, um, Malcolm said that it was uh, Labor's NBN idea and Kevin Rudd was saying, no, it's your idea. But you know why it's your idea? Because there was uh, a big media push against Labor's fibre to the premises idea. Because um, I can hear myself in someone's feedback or something. Um, yeah, the, the Liberal Party took on this new copper and fibre thing because it would be a challenge to, uh, what is it, Foxtel because people could access Netflix more readily. And then, and then suddenly, the you know, political donors of the Liberal Party said, no, no, you shouldn't go for, for Labour's idea. You should uh, you know, screw up the NBN for us. And of course, it, it looks like it's, it's true. Kevin Rudd might, might be right on this one. <laughs> oh, God. Now that's There's some terrible. massive conspiracy. I think it's a matter of... Um... Uh, we've been seeing this for years. Again, I, I I don't want to put the Labor Party on a pedestal. I don't think that their views are like the Pope. They're completely infallible. They've never done anything wrong. I mean, obviously, we're all going to have disagreements. But it's it's one of the things where the Liberal Party, again and again and again, everything bad that happens is always Labor's fault. And anything good that happens, oh, Liberal did that. It's like... It, it is one of those things where, the you know... Oh, this is this is Labor's fault. They did this. Well, again, we have the evidence. It's not. It's your fault. Oh no, nah, but but it was Labor's fault though. Yeah, it's it's standard political one-upmanship though. They do that every time. Uh, it's just you know, 
it, it, it really got on my nerves how you saw that happen. It's, it's sort of a common trademark in Western democracy, where literally every time you see an election, it's more focused on trashing the other guy than presenting your own policy structure and what you're going to do, and what your plan is. I think that's something that made Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn's campaign so successful because they put their plans on the table and offered an alternative, which is why I think the uh, reactionary, both the reactionary right parties and the reactionary factions inside the leftist parties clamped down on them so hard because, um, you know, it, it never actually occurred to the, to the right wing members of the uh, Labour Party and to the... Uh, Democrats and Labour Party in Britain, it never really occurred to them that they actually have to find a way to make this policy happen. Um, and now they're landed with the thought that, well, now actually we do. Well, not in the Democrats' case, anyway. Um, uh, yeah. No, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah, I can understand, like, the original point about putting Labour Party on a pedestal. That's actually absolutely fine to bring up. Most people who join political organisations do so because they actually want to create some sort of positive change from within. That's definitely a character of the left faction, and that's why you do have these instances occurring where you'll find that somebody who has quite progressive views comes forth and does quite well within the public eye in putting forth a set of social policies. In Bertie Sanders' case, it was Medicare. And um, in Jeremy Corbyn's case, it was renationalisation of key industries. And then all of a sudden, the Labour Party were left with a public mandate to actually follow through with these policies, despite the fact that, um, in reality, they had actually been operating on platforms that wouldn't allow the introduction of these things. And because of that, at the same time, they didn't have a plan for any sort of transition over, whereas you had people who were in these pockets. These were democratic socialists, so even some quite left-leaning social democrats who had um, been playing these ideas for years, and all of a sudden, like, okay, it can be a point of disagreement where you'll find that people within parties will say, okay, no, nah, we just we got to shut this down, like what's happening with the Democratic Party in the US at the moment. I know there's been some very serious allegations in terms of people having their party memberships um, terminated or even some expulsions going on. And then you've got, oh, that's been happening in the UK as well. That's not limited to the United States. So even during that last vote, second leadership vote between Jeremy Corbyn and Owen Smith, there were a good deal of people who were trying to bring it to public attention, the fact that they had been expelled from the Labour Party because they'd openly campaigned for Jeremy Corbyn. But um, then you've got the Australian case. Um, there's a senator called Kim Carr. He was actually saying, because of the efforts via the left-wing elements of the party, the actual policy programs have shifted probably to one of the most progressive points they've actually been in a very long time since Gough Whitlam, for instance. The idea that um, the Labour Party would only be taking funding from the top two tax brackets to fund a system like the NDIS. I mean, if you'd asked a party member this back in 2004 when someone like Mark Latham was head of the party, it would be like, bullshit, it never happened, and now it actually is. So things can sort of come in and out of nowhere, but it really is a demonstration that parties themselves are fairly dynamic in their platforms they actually put forth. They can go one way or the other, and it's all depended upon the actual political participation of members of the of um, <laughs> the respective nations that they're trying to campaign for. It kind of gives me hope after that, because you see after Corbyn's victory in the UK, and it was a victory even though he lost, let's face it, it was. Absolutely. Um, uh, you, look at, you look at what's happened after Bernie. I talk to Democrats, and even I talk to current serving US soldiers, besides the... Uh, Besides some of my friends, and I do have friends who live in Texas and stuff who are, you know, died in the wall, you know, conservatives. And I do, I do have friends like that. Um, besides them, even serving military personnel are very, very unhappy with Trump. They don't like him very much. N nobody really is liking him except his small clique of supporters. Um, and when I ask, you know, when I ask actual Republicans who voted for Trump, you know, 
what do you think about Bernie Sanders, they almost all come to the conclusion that uh, they said to me, quite frankly, that, look, if the Democrats had, ra had run Bernie, we would have lost, like, period. Trump would have been burned to the ground. Uh, they wouldn't have, he wouldn't have stood a chance. And it's just, it, it just shows that, you know, the, the right wing of, of the Democrat Party is immolating, like the, the, uh, the, popul the, the popular masses of the United States are moving to a more progressive platform. And it's, been, it's more progressive now than it was, than it has been for, you know, since FDR. You know, there's, there's a real swing back to the, uh, to the idea of the New Deal. And um, Bernie was a big part of that. And so I have hope that our American comrades might be able to pull a rabbit out of the hat within four years. Because I think um, in my true positivist fashion, I think that Trump is going to have accelerated things so fucking badly that I, the Democrats have to get their shit together. Otherwise, America as an institution is royally screwed. Because well, that yeah. gets, it, if that thing gets more and more years, we're over. <laughs> you, you're in, it's, it's interesting you mention that because um, Trump may actually be secretly be an accelerationist authorist because he's prepped. He's prepped all the uh, nuclear bombers for <laughs> yeah. 24-hour alert, and his rhetoric against North Korea has increased to like just before saying, "Oh yeah, we're gonna fuck this shit up." Just like. <laughs> He wants to say it. He wants to say he's going to nuke Korea, but he knows he can't. I think what's going to happen is it's going to be one of those Ronald Reagan saying, uh, you know, we've created a law that outlaws the Soviet Union. Bombing commences in 10 minutes. <laughs> I think it's going to be, oh, like, I think, again, being, as an Australian, watching America from the sidelines and then sort of talking to Americans, like, what's, what's up? I like... It's just crazy how some of them are, like, totally fine and others are, like, going full fucking hodger. Like, they're building, you know, they, they're stockpiling shit. They're getting ready. Like, it's happening, boys. It's happening. Happening. <laughs> Alert. Fucking red buttons. Red buttons. Ooga, ooga. Like, some of them are so dead set that there's going to be, like, nuclear holocaust in the next three months and others are just, like, carry on as usual, boys. So it's kind of weird to, like, I mean... Again, not, not making predictions for the future, but it's just kind of weird to sort of talk to these people and get get the different reactions that you do get. Well, is there any uh, reaction like that in Australia, though? Because we're, um, I think, I think we're, we're a part of, you know, NATO and the UN and whatnot. And if oh, Trump we're not is, a part of NATO. We're not part of NATO, but we are... We're in CETO, South ah, okay. Treaty Organization. So does that mean uh, if Trump tries to go after North Korea or provoke North Korea into an attack, does that mean Australia is going to get dragged into it as well? I mean, our biggest military um, uh, ally is America. So it's, yeah, pretty much. It's going to be, it would be sort of like Iraq and Afghanistan where even if we're not like, com uh, even if we're not like legally obliged to, we'll do it on more of a moral level to, you know, we're allies with these countries, so thumbs up for them. All right, well, if uh, if North if the war with North, North Korea kicks off, I'll meet you lads in the uh, Nullarbor, eh? We'll hide out there. Oh, yeah, the, the people's commune yeah, of uh, Uluru. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I, I honestly sort of go, um, I'm sort of looking at the whole situation, and I think, you know, I reckon, I reckon we'll be all right, because I can sort of see that moment, you know, that declaration of war, like, Australia is now at war with Korea, and to quote, um, what's his name, I uh, can't remember, Shooter Williamson, I think the channel is, uh, the channel is, to quote him directly, all right, cunts, we're going to send Damo, we're going to get, we're going to send Terry, we're going to send my boy Dazza. we're going to go over there, we're going to show these kids what's up, like, like we're going to fucking end them, bro. Um... No, but seriously, we'll get, we'll get Bruce with his hunting knife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> slap, slap yeah, Bruce out there. Yeah. He'll be over in a week. <laughs> Absolutely, VB. Yeah, I have heard well, some. Quite... Yeah, so, I have yeah. heard some quite conflicting. Like, I'm, I'm not even entirely sure what to make of the North Korean situation at the moment. Uh, one of my former teachers, my tutors for a subject I did last semester in international politics, 
he um, has specialised um, within Asian politics for his entire academic career. Um, Triple J got in contact with him to get his opinion on the subject, and they said, is there any reason to be concerned? And his opening sentence was, nah. So <laughs> combine <laughs> that very in-depth uh, analysis of the situation along with a lot of um, sources you're getting through media outlets. And there have been some credible internationals um, specialists who work in foreign policy saying otherwise that we should be concerned with what's happening on and going on. Well, one, I don't even know what in particular I'm meant to be concerned about. The initial assumption is nuclear holocaust given that that's one of the possibilities is probably going to be one of the ones you think of first, or whether or not it's some sort of other international legal technicality that will affect national development and status. I, I just don't know. I mean, that's the thing. There just doesn't seem to be that much proper access to information by the general public. Of course, that's an issue that's been known from by most communities and populations in, in um, nation states ever since Julian Assange when it became really popular to be one of those conspiracy theorists about international political dealings. Well, it's, it, I'm not really surprised. I, when people ask me what the best outcome for this situation is regarding North Korea, I mean, super tankies get really pissed off at me when I say this, but quite honestly, the only way out I see for North Korea to sort of, you know, be saved or something while simultaneously stop the Americans from just pretty much bombing everyone they like. I think the only choice really here is for Mr. Deng Xiaoping to roll over the border and annex North Korea at this point. Because otherwise, you know, shit's just going to get absolutely real. Because there's so much, so much shit you can talk before you either have to nut up or shut up or... You just have to back down because I think because what thing really doesn't what really doesn't sort of gel with me is North Korea thinks it's a good idea to launch rockets over Japan. Like they didn't they didn't just ditch him in the sea like last time. They flew them over Japan and ditched him on the other side. <laughs> you know, they've done yeah. this in the past as well. They've done I, yeah. several several rockets and then I know of two confirmed. Missiles that have gone over the North Island of Japan, and wars have been started for less over things like that. It's 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 it. They're trying to posture and say like, you know, come at us. You know, we've we've violated your airspace, and then and then if it doesn't work, Trump's actually going to waddle his leathery ass over to the red big red button and press it and then we're all dead yeah there's um it's something i've thought of i mean obviously i don't want to downplay how terrible fired nuclear weapons would be i mean it'd be pretty bad oh no like, please please yeah but um it seems like i always get weary um, when the media tends to heavily broadcast wartime events in particular. Um, it seems to me, well, it seems to me to be a possibility that this possibly could be a major political distraction from other issues that are occurring at the same time. For one, you've got a moron in the White House who thinks he's not a moron. Uh, Two, you've got the European Union where there are all sorts of political scenarios going on. I mean, we've just had a German election where you've had some very, very people just sort of, just short of displaying swastikas elected to the German Reichstag. Uh, you've got South America where you've got major environmental catastrophes as well as several political demonstrations that are being very violently shut down happening in Brazil in particular. Um, don't mistake me making any critiques of Venezuela. That's another basket case in of itself. Ooh. But uh, then, um, of course, you've got Asia as a whole. I mean, uh, the Indian parliament as well is um, looking at all sorts of uh, political happenings and our own home country of Australia as well. Uh, the fact that we've had what has been judged to be the worst infrastructure disaster, I think, of the 20th century. I'm not entirely sure what the New York Times said, but when the New York Times is openly attacking 
conservative liberal government policies in another country, you know they've probably fucked up. So definitely there are some absolute concerns to be made of the North Korean situation, but whether or not that might be a bit of a veil of ignorance being put over people's eyes to take away from critique of other policies that are going on politically right now is a, another thing maybe just to be well, aware of. I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, brighten the tone or anything, but to be quite honest, I think I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm personally in that mode, you know, have you any, you guys have seen Monty Python, right? Mm-hmm. No, I, you know that you know that scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, like three quarters of the way through. Um, it's it's just how I feel. I've just got this picture of you know Kim Jong Un, and it just sort of cuts to him staring down Donald Trump, and you've got you know freaking John Cleese and Michael Palin just all coming together saying, "Get on with it! <laughs> Hurry up! Please. Someone shoot somebody for the love of God! You're talking a whole big game, and then nothing's happening. I mean, look." My bunker is not going to build itself, and we need we need the radioactive cloud of death to shine like a beacon for our alien comrades to liberate us, okay? You don't understand. We are waiting. We need to light the signal fire and bring forth our comrades from the stars. Otherwise, full communism is never going to happen. So tell those kids to push the button and get it over with. <laughs> I think the only... Uh part I could agree with that is that uh, there needs to be some kind of conclusion to this dick measuring contest between North Korea and America like I hope I hope that they, they decide like all right fine we can we can stop rubbing now di- hammer and sickles together you know, our dicks together um, let's let's go home I hope they decide that before like uh, guns start getting shot off or before you know these reactivated bombers take off and start heading towards North Korea. Look, I'll be frank. Being someone who's sort of you know spends his entire spare time LARPing as a general, um, let's let's be frank. Um, if the North Koreans do instigate war with the United States, it it's going to be a genocide of half the Korean population. It's just going to happen. Half the Korean population is going to be wiped out because of the arrogance of some <laughs> type of little shit and Kim Jong-un's refusal to surrender. Um, let's, just, let's just be frank here. Um, the North Korean military is the largest standing army in the world, um, but it's, it's probably one of the... It's the only one which doesn't have any external trade, and its defensive position is very weak. It's so they're up against the most powerful navy in the world when they have two large coastlines and their GDP and their total force capability is still somewhere in the 1970s. Um, besides that, all their all their top funding has gone into their missile program as an act of deterrence similar to um, good old corn man's approach in the 19 in the 1960s um, if we can build a big enough nuclear missile to make attacking us too costly we'll be able to cut back on defense spending at home which is a solid plan the only issue is it precludes the willingness of the enemy to attack I don't think Trump with the with the technological and military superiority he has, will hesitate in using it if he thinks he can get away with it. Um, mm. Let's face it, every every the Republican president, when they faced a slump in the polls, has started a small war. I mean, it's not it's not a it's not a co- it's not a coincidence. And the thing that I think has got most people worried is that Trump has said over and over again it was his campaign promise for fuck's sake. Uh, Trump is uh, go big or go home. So. I think it's a very real possibility that he might start a shooting war with Korea. Um, quite frankly, I think it's quite a possibility. Well, I guess um, only... Oh, shit! Um, oh, my God! Here, Here he, he is. is! It's the Perfect man! Perfect timing. It's man the man of the, of the hour. Hour. G'day, Bako. Oh, 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 oh well, we oh. may get Bako in just a second. He might be sorting out his audio issues. Um, so just to switch the topic over 
Um, while we were getting ready for this podcast, the Australian Federal Police raided the Australian Workers Union headquarters in Sydney and Melbourne as part of the Get Up, uh, the Get Up investigation. With Get Up being a um, act- activist group, is that the best way to describe them? I think that's a fair call. Yeah, well, yeah. Like, um, clearly, from you know, from my perspective, clearly this is either some kind of distraction um, heading into the high court case, or it's the last sort of death throes of um, the the coalition trying to do as much damage as possible before they're voted out. Well, I've got a gonna, little bit of information. Oh, wait, there's back really? Going. No, I, no, I know a little. So, yeah, okay. I know a little bit about obviously being a member of the Labor Party. I know a little bit about the union movement. The AWU in particular is um, probably something you would describe more as a centrist union. It doesn't possess the same level of militancy that you would see in a trade union organisation like the CFMEU. They've been sort of more willing to balance the idea of picket lines along with. Um, lobbying bosses so basically going into offices and having meetings they've copped a bit of flack over the over the years it's sort of a leftover from back when the group was first founded they had some major strikes in queensland where they went full full picket lines full you know coal miners versus the police force but um it didn't end out well and ever since they've sort of veered away from that process what's really going to come to light here is actually the connection with Bill Shorten in particular. So for those who don't know, Bill was actually the national secretary of the AWU and was actually national secretary of the AWU when this transaction to get up occurred. On top of that, he was also a member of the board of directors for get up. So my guess is that there'll be a whole lot of personal attacks and insinuations over his activities while he was national Secretary of the AWU, and um, in terms of Will how successful be- they would be, I mean, we've seen <laughs> the Liberal Party's one of their main strategies has actually been to shit talk short in the whole way. But the problem is, is it? I mean, they've sort of been counterbalanced by the fact that uh, there have been people in the Labor Party other than Bill who have attracted uh, better popular opinion. People like Tanya Plibersek and. Um, Mark Dreyfus as well. In terms of how successful it'll be, I don't know. I'll leave that to the judgment of other people. Hmm. Hmm. So this um, rhetoric and character assassination will obviously be coming from... um, It'll be coming specifically from Michaelia Cash, I think. She's been the main person who's been leading this beer tackle to shit-canning unions ever since she's held the position as a Minister for Workplace Relations and Employment. she's The CFMU has been one of her primary targets because they're one of the main unions that's been most active and vocal about the different reforms that are going forth that have been targeting workers in some of the most vitriolic methods, like the ABCC. That earns us the judgment like, for the United Nations. Yeah, there's been probably union laws equivalent to our earlier discussion topic of North Korea. I mean, it's ridiculous that they would be focusing that much legal attention and prosecution towards an organization. I mean, here's just like a general example in particular. So clubs like the AFL have actually had more criminal charges lobbied against them successfully than the entire union movement. I mean, are we going to have royal commissions at the sporting clubs? No. Why not? Because... Sporting clubs aren't the only um, supply and source of campaigning for your workers' rights and um, donations towards political parties that have left-leaning views. Mm. Isn't that woman the um, the same woman who wrote all those really cringy um, poems about my free markets and shit? She's probably done a shit ton of crazy things in her life that I don't want to know about. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Jackie Lambie described her, described her as a spider lady. I think it was actually. Jackie. Okay, okay, you've got to be. Yeah, gosh, you've got to be pretty bad for Jackie Lambie to describe you as a spider lady. That's <laughs> that's, that's, that's <laughs> development in horseshoe theory right there. That's um, some real radical some... centrism we got there. <laughs> oh, fuck me. <laughs> We're on a different level now. Yeah, so you see, to be fair. 
you have to have a very high IQ to understand Jackie Lambie. The political positions are incredibly nuanced. Well, do you think, like, in Australian oh. politics, is it getting to the point that all of these, like, one-seat parties and independent parties and micro party like like the murdering enthusiast party are they starting to lose relevancy and are we going to see them disappear eventually or is the reverse going to happen and they're actually going to be the balance of power nah the, the reverse is going to happen but, I, but, but here's what i got to ask who the fuck are the motor um oh, the motorhead the, um, party the motorhead the, the motor like, like, party. Like, I, I, i'd actually this vote is... for the motorhead party Ricky Muir is basically they really have their positions uh, it's kind of like those single policy parties like the, the fishing and hunting, hunter shooter fishing party uh, it's yes. kind of groups like that that have like a single solid political position and everything else is just sort of yeah, oh, I want to say in like, uh, like yeah, it, it really takes a backseat to the um, their, their policy about the, well, literally the motorcycles and whatnot and motor vehicles are uh, really, everything else is kind of a secondary and they'll just work with, uh, you see them working with like the Liberals and the Nationals and whatnot. Uh, but that, yeah, I, I think those parties are sort of going to, I mean, in the Senate, I think when uh, Malcolm Turnbull came and the first election happened the first election well yeah, you know what i mean like the last election the, the sort of mess that is the senate now with all these uh independent political parties with like um you know one nation all of that uh bob catter um oh what's his name the the, the senate one. to write bullshit that we're getting yeah um, yeah, Nick yeah. yeah. I, I, no, no. <laughs> well, not, Nicky no. Oh, Nicky, build that battery. Um, <laughs> uh, what's it called? Like, <laughs> like, like Clive, like Clive Palmer. A lot of those sort of really weird, oh. inde independent sort of fringe Clive. groups. I think that I, I don't want to say that they're going to go away instantly, but do you, do you reckon? Do you reckon? I'm sorry to cut you off, Gorge. I just hold that thought. Mm. But do you reckon that you know how you get those? Um, faces of Clive Palmer, like you know, going red as a, a rose, and he's basically just shouting. <laughs> Must look like when he nuts. <laughs> oh, <Jesus laughs> know, like no, no. Can you just imagine what it looked when it just like, looked oh, like oh, oh, all that, oh, all that oh, pressure oh, building up, and then oh, finally he just goes. Whoa! Like I know what, I know what. So um, fat, I, was gonna, yeah. I was gonna say Barnaby Joyce because Barnaby gets really fucking red. He looks like oh, he's that, about that's to, him. Maybe that might be him. Yeah, Barnaby looks like he's about to pop a blood vessel whenever he gets all angry. Oh, I'm sorry, I but, think I might be thinking about Barnaby. Oh, <laughs> sorry, like, <laughs> uh, to be fair, a lot of, like, uh, to those of you who are not in Australia, basically, Australian politicians are pretty much interchangeable. It's the only <laughs> thing that separates them is the, the sort of the colour tie that they wear. But, no, um, <laughs> all I can sort of see is at the end of that, after all their sort of panting and huffing, it's just like, oh no, oh no, and you just see Albo kicking the door like, oh yeah! <laughs> 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 Anthony Albo using the Kool-Aid man. Just kicking the fucking door in there. Out of nowhere. Our political forefathers must be rolling in their grave hearing this conversation. <laughs> Oh, ah, we've, 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 we've come. Kind of, we we truly have come such a long way since Federation. <laughs> we have. I mean, we, I mean, what have we gone? We've gone from Federation to a shout. To, yeah, we've gone from Federation to uh, shit posting in Parliament and uh, to fighting emus, and now here we are. The the, the we real lost that war, hours. The <laughs> emu war not, not was almost not, fucking not, killed you. Remember? Ne nearly, nearly they did. But um, you might have known that there was a little uh, nuclear <laughs> test field called the emu fields. <laughs> just, just a tiny well, little, I, little nuclear practice. test. You'll never yeah. beat the Aussies. <laughs> I think they, this, is, this is this is the um. This is what the liberal media doesn't want you to see. You know? <laughs> I think that uh, going back to <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> going back to the, the sort of independent parties, uh, it's certainly. I think that it's going to be a fifty-fifty thing. I think we are going to see them slowly wither away as they sort of fall in line with the mm. um, the Liberal Party and the Coalition and whatnot. But at the same time, you get groups like Nick Xenophon, who peak centrism, by the way. 
who essentially he who sees himself as like you know the the bargain master you know he's he's the house in the the casino of parliament he's got all the chips he's gonna no he's got, everyone's at his beck and call for some inextricable reason but I think we we will get a lot of groups like that, uh, those independent parties who will, at to some degree, hold the balance of um, power in parliament. Did you guys see Goulash though? You're an SA guy like me. Yes. Did you know that he's running for his? Yeah, oh, you the bet. Liberal, I saw the that. liberal safe seat. He's running for a liberal safe seat. But the thing is, my dad and I crunched the numbers the other night, and you know what? It could very well come to pass that Nick Xenophon might actually be able to form yes. government. Oh my god! Like, if Nick Xenophon forms government, he would like be the only independent party state in in the country. Out of all, like you know, you've got all these countries. Then South Australia is just sort of sitting over here, like fuck the lot of you. I thought that <laughs> was Western <laughs> Australia. Like, yeah. I mean, we're, we're no, 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 no. <laughs> there is something to take into account with Nick Xenophon. I think that's actually a bit of his backstory. So while he was at university, Nick was a member of the Young Liberal Movement. In fact, it was because this is the reason why he became an independent in the first place, because one of the um, positions, uh, which was the student council or for some newspaper, I think, the Young Libs used some sort of campaign tactic by which they could um, split the Young Labor vote. And that basically got him a short electorate. And he said after that sort of um, interaction he had in terms of the what's the word I'm looking for, the disregard for the electoral systems they had in place by major parties. He just went off them all completely. But I do worry that some of his former leanings might still be present in his so-called centrist politics. I mean, the thing about centrism itself is that it's not really a properly outlined position. I mean, it still has those leanings towards things like neoliberal economics, even though um, he himself has been in favour of some protectionist measures like... Um, trying to secure contracts for submarine building in South Australia. But if you look at some of his other actions, it was his winning vote in the Senate that actually allowed for the Australian Building and Construction Commission to actually be re-established as um, so-called watchdog of unions. And if you look at where the votes in particular were coming from, if you look at the large area in northern South Australia like Mayo, I mean, that is currently a liberal seat, correct me if I'm wrong, quite a safe one, as well as where Rebecca Sharkey managed to get in the House of Representatives as well. I mean, no, that's the liberal seat of Mayo. So that's, that used to be Alexander Downer's seat. That was John Howard's foreign affairs minister. So I am a bit weary of people. Nick Xenophon is probably, the, I would exercise some caution around his political leanings because they do um, have a little bit of the odour of, um, odour of blue in the background, I think. Well, 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 I don't think I'm actually denying that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, well, I'll, um, I'll tell you this. I'll t sorry, just hold that thought, yep. but I'll tell you this. If Nick Xenophon is able to form a government and he does become prime minister, I'll definitely guarantee you fellas this. There'll be a shit ton less wind turbines, I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> Those filthy wind turbines. No, anti wind seriously. Anti Wind turn, but oh, Jesus. I remember anyway, continuing reading, on. Sorry, just had to check oh, in that joke. Uh, if I might just interrupt, hold that thought uh, again. I remember reading, uh, I think someone showed it to me, that there was like these, um, oh, it was like a recent poll somewhere in South Australia, and they said 41% uh, would support a um, uh, Nick Xenophon uh, sort of uh, state government and part of me just sort of I had to sit there for a minute and think how did we get here like <laughs> how did we get to this position where 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 nearly the majority is enthusiastic about this it's, um, does that come from the it, performance of the the political parties that are in government in state and on, on the federal level now in that people are so dissatisfied with this quasi two-party system that we have in Australia that they're reaching out to anything or anyone other than Labour or Coalition. I think that's part of it in a, in a, in a big sense. I mean, as, I, as I've been saying a million times before and it's going to be my running gag through this whole thing, it's I don't care as long as I get to collectivise Woomera. 
I mean, let's face it. <laughs> as long as I can nuke everything at the end of this, I don't really care because I've given up. But the point is, in general, is that if we're going to make any progress, at least having Nick Xenophon around in an accelerationist kind of position is like, it'll, it'll scare the main parties shitless. And that's something mm -hmm. that I think I can get behind, at least in a sort of like, you know, it's, I'd, I'd rather see the, the socialist wing of the Labour Party make a proper comeback, as our comrade here, Jack, is trying to achieve. Oh, we're but, always trying our best. We're, we're trying your best, but, you know, like, if, if worse comes to it, maybe maybe the fear of, you know, an independent party coming up and, you know, usurping their power might actually force them to start amending their policies a little bit. True. And caving to the electorate. Yeah. It does. That, that is true yeah. to an extent. Yep. Sorry, you Sorry, can go you first. Go first no, 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 no. You know, you, I was going to... Yeah. Um, uh, I think we'll uh, back code you go first, and then we'll hear from uh, Jack. Okay. Well, what I was going to say is that I think the damage that's already been done by the Liberals, I think, is almost to an extent irreversible. I mean, to the point where I believe, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to sound like a bit of a pessimist, and I'll stand, I'll stand wrong in this unless I see otherwise, but I honestly believe that the damage done by the Liberals, the fact that they've sold off so much of our public assets, I honestly think that it's going to do sweet, Nick Xenophon's going to be able to do sweet FA to actually put a, a suitable band-aid on the problems which we have. Unless we could, like, here's the thing. We have policies that pretty much make it impossible for workers to go on strike. The Liberals have already started to go on full damage control, smashing unions. But then again, this hasn't been anything new. What if they, how many, how many federations have they crushed now? They crushed a teacher's federation, a fucking nurse's federation, um, like a shit ton of unions. Honest, honest to God, I think that if Australia is going to see any genuine change i don't i do not think that it can come from any I, i'm sorry this is just the anarchist in me so you'll forgive me <laughs> um but i do not think i do not think that a is an effective tool to enact some change because as far as what i have i have seen and throughout the trend of um you know australian politics the labor labor government makes some good some pretty dang good progress if you ask me but then the liberals fuck it up and Partly comes back in, the policy is almost near irreversible. Is almost near irreversible. Actually, to the point, it it is just irreversible. We used to have like a genuine free education, but now we have to pay an extra bit of a privatized fee to it. Um, you know, it's. I just generally don't. I if people like started voting for Nick Xenophon, it's going to be the equivalent of what we have now. It's just going to be stagnant. And while we could like say, oh yes, you know Malcolm Turnbull, you know he gave him, like um, the Nationals and so on, I still don't think that even though Nick Xenophon may not be in league with them, I still do not think that he is going to be the great change that some Australians want. I do think that there is this kind of disillusionment with even even with independent parties, and I think with the state, I think that people because because the, the far right has had their like their you know their crack of the whip and they've fallen flat in their face. For being exposed for the decades that they are. At this point, I don't really think that we can really, really trust a, a liberal um, capitalist state to actually um, go forth and maintain its policies, which may be somewhat more beneficial to the rest of Australia. That's just me. I, I highly doubt that it's going to come down. There has to be. I think. This is the thing. Um, I think that we are heading for a financial crisis of epic magnitudes right here. I mean, considering the fact that we have no public funding um, to save our skin, if there is going to be another economic crisis within Australia, I, I'm going to assume that we're fucked. That's so, uh, a fair call. Yeah. To that. So yeah. back, Backo is following um, standard oh. Backo procedure, which he wants to follow uh, Smashy Smashy, which is... <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> smashy Smashy. Much. So yeah, Jack. Um, what, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, it's um, it's a fair point you're making there in terms of specifically financially. I've got a friend who um, it's pretty much his wet dreams to be going through economic projectiles and things like that. Um, in terms of uh, if we're looking at the position of having um, trying to create positive change via the parliamentary system we have in place, there is an issue that can arise from having um from the public putting their faith within minor parties and i think it's this more than anything well one either the minor parties don't make up enough strength 
to actually become a proper challenge to the major parties in the first place. Um, a lot of people might not completely remember, but um, up until about 2007, the third force in Australian politics was a group called the Australian Democrats, which was another centrist party. Uh -huh. Their slogans yeah. were, keep the bastards on us. And that was appropriated Actually, yeah. then by, the Pirate party. Yeah, by another, another political party, which has come up the ranks recently, which we now know as the Australian Greens, but they've sort of um, reached a new problem, in my opinion. There's actually a very good article that was written by Socialist Alternative, believe it or not, of all groups, <laughs> that um, talked about how the party, instead of um, having this attitude of trying to keep the bastards honest, they've gotten to the point where they would rather replace the bastards in some case, which we've seen. <laughs> I mean, in the amount of um, major campaigning tactics by the Greens haven't so much been like, you've seen some exemptions like Higgins, Jason Ball did a terrific job in campaigning against Cali O'Dwyer and trying to get a blue ribbon seat to go green. I've got no problem with them fighting Tories. The problem is, is that they've been taking um, major other Labour Party inner seats area as well because those are voters they can more easily win over and try to replace in the first place. It's um, sort of shifting from that position of being a proper activist to becoming a party of professionalism that tries to get into government via the usual methods and mechanisms and ends up just basically being a reflection of the party it ended up replacing in the first place. I mean, if it's the case where you are going to just be changing the colour of the party, I'd say, well, why not just start out with the party that's already there and try and change that into a more um, positive group that actually reflects and institutes policies that actually helps the general public at large. I mean, that's, that's um, a yeah, point. Yeah. I think that's a fair point, too. But I will have to, but again, I'm going to have to be a bit of, again, the pessimistic anarchy of the group that's here fine. again. <laughs> I, I'm considered actually going um, on my council to, um, to you know, and joining the Labour's, uh, Labour movement just to see what how, how things operate, how things tick, and so on and so on. But again, what I just constantly see is, like, yes, I hope that the best that yes we can through the state somehow by some miracle able to like you know um policy allow us to carry out these um these policies that we envision you know more advocating for more workers control and so on but the thing is i'm not too sure how exactly we're going to be able to achieve socialism within australia via form of parliamentary politics and because let's let's be perfectly candid here the ideas of communism and socialism by the media and considering the fact that the amount of influence that the liberal and i mean this in the australian sense that the liberal media has on a lot of um out media outlets when they start talking about socialism it's going to be very interesting actually hang on i'll be right back hold that thought oh Okay. <laughs> well, I'm um, waiting very intently on this half-finished sentence. Well, as, it's, I, it's, as it's, I said, Backco's just—he he just wants smashy, smashy. Let's let's be honest. <laughs> Backco he's wants to... right now to dismantle the federal government. That's why he's <laughs> <laughs> he's coming back. I promise. Um, I, I guess okay. a question I'll pose is: um, Are you back, Backco? You good? Well, so, he's anyway, he's um, back. What was, sorry, what was I saying? Sorry, I just had to uh, talk to the room out there. Anyway, so um, what, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, so I was talking about the state. Um, so the, the thing is, because the liberal media does control, I mean, I'll stand corrected on this. I'll, I'll, on this. The liberal media does have a genuine sway of a lot of our media outlets. So the second that even if we were able to get a majority in parliament, be it a social, be it a genuine socialist, um, like, you know, thing you know democratic socialist whatever um the amount of slander that we're going to get i mean here's the thing even though we know that a lot of their things are going to be true you know oh we know what they're probably going to say oh my venezuela my ussr my cuba my china math mass starvation and so on and so on um i feel that that's really going to have it have a giant effect on the people and i'm not too sure if they are going to last as long in Parliament as we want them to in order to implement their policies without having some form of genuine uh, public disapproval. I mean, it's not necessarily, I mean, I take that back genuine, I take that back genuine because it's, 
like it's manufactured and it's going to be probably a bunch of lies. But I figured just the amount of um, propaganda that we're going to see against the socialist government is going to be pretty gnarly. And I think it's going, and I think because the, again, because a lot of um, millionaires are in, are in the pockets of these, um, these fuckers, it's going to be very, um, and because like it, it's got, the media is going to have a genuine sway over us. So unless it's like, you know, Trump and the whole fake news shit, even I'm somewhat skeptical of um, the positive effect that a socialist uh, government, even though I think it would be positive, how it's going to be interpreted by the rest of the, Austra of the Australian population is going to be a bit, I feel somewhat going to be negative. So given um, everything you've described and through the conditions and the, and the political system that we have in Australia, how far to the left could we actually get Australia? That is a good question because we, because we have to also analyse the material conditions as to what we are. I do not think that Australia at the moment is full-on leftist. I think that they are definitely dissatisfied with the Liberals and they're going to vote Labour, but that's not as far left as we want them to go if you follow if you catch my drift and the and the damage done by the liberals is going to be almost impossible to solve by the labor party you know we might just say oh yes the labor will fix it in reality it's going to take a shit ton of time to do so and by that time they who knows they might even get voted out so this raises the next so this raises the next point if we are going to kind of um have this whole labor thing if we are going to have to see a genuine rise in far left movement i think that there needs to be a as much as i hate to sound like a left come here there needs to be the right material conditions and people to get desperate enough to seek out radical politics i don't i mean we have to i mean yes we could agree that the far right has had an international effect but that's kind of backfired but what about the far left what can we do what are we there for? So I think that if, if Australia is going to see a genuine far left movement, it is going to be during a time of strife, which I think is going to come at a, at a given certain point in time. But the thing is, though, we ourselves, be it, um, be it anarchists, uh, Marxists and so on, are not that organized to actually deal with this situation. And, you know, causing an insurrection within Australia is almost nigh impossible due to the fact that we have so much um, gun laws. So unless we can find a way to kind of like, you know, do illegal shit, which again, I'm not suggesting we do, but it's very possible. Even if we did, it'd be, you know, I don't want to be in court saying things that I don't want to be caught saying, if you get what I mean. But basically, you know, um, it's got the material conditions. It's going to be very, 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 very hard for us to do so. And I do not think that we are going to see a genuine left-wing revolution or a um, or a left-wing change of politics unless we have the right conditions to do so. And even then, we have to be organized before we do so, which at this given point in time, to my knowledge, we aren't. So, well, uh, kids, you've heard well, yeah. it here first. <laughs> Austra Australia's, <laughs> Australia's, Australia's senior leftist shit poster says we've got to buy an armchair. Fuck yes! <laughs> I didn't say so, that. I said I said I never said anything about spontaneous um, organization. I actually said that we need to be organized before we do so, but we have to wait. Uh, uh, have to now, Batco, we've got you here now. Oh, shit. <laughs> shit. <laughs> Too late now. Batco, I, I know, I'm Batco the Bordigist, great. The mask yeah. is <laughs> I just bought a plan. I just wanted to ask oh, Jack's no. opinion on this because you're. You're deep into the sausage factory of politics. <laughs> What's your opinion on? Italy, like, it is how... the sausage factory at the moment. <laughs> yeah, how Unfortunately, far? Unfortunately, liberals won't put affirmative action clauses <laughs> forth. So, <laughs> until then, we've got people like Ian Good Enough and Arthur Senadinos haunting the halls of Parliament. But I'm sorry, I'm too busy making shit talking jokes about men to actually hear what your question was. What was it? It was um, in your opinion because you're you know deep into the into the <laughs> sausage factory um how far left do you think we could go in australia well it's um it's sort of an interesting question i mean it's not something specifically we can answer as a movement but nor is it something that can really be predicted either by media sources because they have an inherent interest in perpetuating the idea that most people are not left-wing at all. They're either something along the lines of uh, centrist or centre-right. Centre-left, maybe, on a good day. Um, but um, 
It's probably not so much a question that's actually really been asked amongst the major, or particularly the Labor Party, how left can we go? The idea is that we've had the policies we want to put forth, we will put them forth and the people will either support them or they will not. Now, um, with this in mind, most people have been a bit critical of this, particularly social democrats. They're the real ones who've taken, or well, they put forth this whole notion of creating change via incremental processes. So reformism, basically, tiny steps. Now, in of itself, there's nothing terribly wrong with that, you would assume. But in terms of this is the issue I encounter with some social democrats. I actually like to do a bit of a Confucian linkage here. So there's a line where Confucius tells one of his followers who's not quite true to the way that um, well, some collapse along the way, but here you draw the line. So they've already sort of decided that the policies will fail in of themselves before they can even be bothered implementing them. The idea is that you actually sort of take a risk. And the thing about ideologies particularly on the left is that they're actually quite well academically formed and they don't gain traction by sort of being hid in the back closet you actually have to introduce them into the public via discourse so people can actually understand what they are i think this is something that's being pushed particularly in the union movement at the moment by that most wonderful of people Sally McManus, the new secretary for the Australian Council of Trade Unions. It was in an article I was reading. I recently just did a project on the trade union movement, which I'm using her as an example. She said she wanted to change what the centre is. I talked earlier about how the centre was malleable. But if you could change the entire sort of system over what is left and right by shifting the population itself as a whole over to the left, I think that is possible. And um, the problem is, is that necessarily these are limitations in political parties doing it because people see it as like oh you're just trying to get our vote so they detect the vested interest of the labor party in making the population left wing because they get more votes they feel like they're being exploited but if you get a group such as the trade union movement such as get up whose positions in of themselves they're not for profit they're genuinely only there to help people they have a better chance of actually putting those positions forth so it's never really been a question of how far left can we go. It's like, how best can we get left and what way would be the best way possible? Um, it differs from person to person. I myself take the democratic socialist route, so I'm not quite ready to abandon the state, though I can fully understand why some people would want to abandon it. The state has, in my opinion, never had a greater monopolization over power of individuals. That's uh, my inner sociologist talking. But um, there's probably still a few routes left in there. And you can only really sort of tell how far they can possibly go once you finally get in there and get your hands dirty. Hmm, very, very concise. Thank you. Um, well, lads, we're at about 121 minutes on this. So uh, I think it might be time. Call it a night? Uh, yeah, start wrapping up. Um, thank you. Thank you to... Uh, all you guys for coming on and thanks back co for coming on uh late so uh if you want to come back that, if you want to come back next week uh, we can have you on for the, for the, uh for the whole time you're very welcome back thank you thank you um any I'd last like thoughts say, from anyone i'd just like to say on my behalf uh not wanting to be too fanboy but i'd just like to say that it's not a true australian shit post stream without Batco here so you know like, you know, like without without Batco here it's, it's not the real Australian shit posting scene so he, he's I, I think we've 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 perfectly utilized uh, his uh his draw his drawing appeal for you know giving us some visibility for you know making the Australian shit posting scene a truly a truly global event so well you've got, you've got to have a very high IQ to understand Batco oh, yeah you've got to have a really <laughs> high IQ to understand Batco yeah Oh, but boys, but boys, boys, boys! Before I go, just I just want I just I just want to drop this fucking bombshell. I'm I take it that some of you are aware of the man known as Ego Sum Jeffem, yes? Yes. Yeah. Well, guess what, fellas? He's got a Twitter. Oh, <laughs> got a Twitter no. now. <laughs> Oh my fucking god! Smash that motherfucking follow button for good takes. <laughs> 
for it. <laughs> All right, uh, I think that's a good point to wrap up. Edgy so, it has been um, lovely, boys. <laughs> thank you for everyone for dropping by. If you're uh, if you missed the live stream, thank you for watching the automatic video upload. If you'd like to see more, hit like and subscribe. And you can also go to easternmarshlands.com to keep up to date. And hopefully we'll be back next week with another evening with comrades. Thank you all and good night. Good night, good night, night fellas. Good night. Later, boys. Free the dolphins.